The alarms of Mine Shaft 15, of the Mars Volta mining base, murdered my ears on that fateful day. I looked up as I stepped in my suit. It was more form-fitting than the 70-foot fiber-reinforced walls of this cavern, which allowed factor vehicles carrying tons of rocks to be processed. My breath fizzled my microphone, created condensation on my helmet screen, and clouded my hearing. Vital signs and a confusing mess of numbers on either side of my helmet screen kept my sanity intact. I was alive, and I never knew how important that distinction would be. The yells coming from the deep confines of the mine were as vicious as they were direct. I walked past the machines coated in moisture from their labors, as if they sweated from the hard work, when in reality, the humidity was the perils of ice sheets that melted into the catastrophic atmosphere that would have killed any of us. Walker and Brady were at the end of this cavern. It was hard to see their faces since they were in their brown or black mecha suits. Everyone wore one down here, and it was difficult to work in, even if they were made for this dangerous line of work. Walker himself was a tall man, but there was no smile on that sleek face of his. We're behind by a whole week, and you allowed this to happen! Brady made his suit look fuller due to his stature and broad shoulders. Right, and I allowed it to drop down there because I'm so dumb, right? I never called you down here to go drink poison. I called her. He pointed in my direction. No, Hera! Can you coordinate the auxiliary shaft's evacuation to the tower as per protocol? I nodded my head. That's what I was called down here to do, but I had to see it for myself. One of the excavators, which was one of the manual digging vehicles, dropped down one of the crevices. A loud skittering noise roared into my speaker. It was like metal fragments shaking in a bag. My teeth clattered from its high-pitched grind. What was that? A few people were looking around, so I wasn't crazy. Brady and Walker were still arguing, though. They learned, just like I did, that the oddities of being underground were best ignored for the sake of your sanity. Do you realize who you're talking to? I should be meeting with the surveyors. But it's a good thing I was evaluating the progress of the work, because I can see why you're behind. Screw-ups like this! A groan echoed as the excavator buckled and slid down a few feet. Welcome to the job, Pencil Nick. Don't you guys think that we should focus on the fact there's millions of dollars currently in a hole right now? They will call in tomorrow. We should get it out before that to give them some good news, don't you think? The two men made reluctant shrugs in agreement. After a brief discussion, they worked out their disagreement and Walker walked away. Brady groaned and shook his head. I said... The Hazard team is coming to assist you. Do you need anything from my end? No, I got it. I took that and led the staff out of that mine shaft and made sure the Hazard team could do their job. After that, I took off my suit and went back to my post, where I saw Dunkley. He was a young lad that was fresh in the face and enthusiastic for this job. If trying to keep two men from strangling each other was a worthy job. Hey Dunkley, how was your patrol? Everything's going fine inside. Checked the oxygen dilation tank. It's been working well so far. It better. Make sure you check it in the morning and the evening, based on the chart. That's when the system recirculates the filters. Pretty loud, too? Sometimes I wonder if it's an earthquake it's producing. Oh, Robinson was complaining about the sounds he was hearing from beyond the surface. I leaned in. Sounds? Yeah. He said it sounded like something was being torn apart. He was worried it was the rock breaking. It was really loud too. So we slowed the progress of the drills. I have to tell Walker, but I haven't found him yet. He's at the surveyor's branch office, so you can catch him there. The alarm bell shouted in our eardrums. I glanced at the panel, and my eyes flickered over to the cameras, where I saw nothing out of the ordinary. The men were moving away from the accident site and Brady, if I was correct, was pointing aggressively at something. These guys again? I asked in frustration. Oh, something's going down on mine 15. You want me to check it out? No, don't sweat it. I already know the situation that's going on down there, so I might as well just deal with it. All right, madam. 
I put back on my suit and went down to the mine shaft. Once I got through the 100-foot gate in my three-wheeled motorcraft, the silence hit me differently. The only thing pounding in my ears were the cracks of stone under the wheels. Where was everybody? Yes, I evacuated the auxiliary staff, but the main drilling crew should be here with the hazard consolidation team. I breathed out and decided they were probably too busy dealing with that accident. After I passed down the first channel and reached the next to an idle excavator, that skittering sound returned. At that point, it didn't even sound so distant. The sound got louder and more distorted. I stopped the motorcraft and looked around. Was this the sound that Robinson was talking about? This did not sound like rock breaking in from the inside, but I could take no chances. A mine shaft collapse was one of the worst disasters that could happen outside of a fire. I had to be sure, so I tried to call Walker on my radio, but I got no answer. Dunkley was my best option. Hey, is Walker around you right now? Yeah, hold on. O'Hara? Walker, I'm hearing noises in Mine 15, and Robinson talked about noises in Mine 6. Did you see anything on the maps when you did your usual scans? What? No, I saw nothing. What noises? Look, I don't know yet, Walker, but you need to check it. A shadow passed by me. Was it over me? I refocused my mind on the call. Just check it out. I don't want to hear that we didn't do our due diligence, okay? Pretty sure it wasn't me. They must be drilling wrong like they always do. But I'll check it out. I sat in a deep shadow. My head turned, and all I saw was this huge blob with long thin arms, like some malnourished octopus flying around. I froze. The words were stuck on my tongue. Those arms moved over me and waded the air as if it was the sea. I tried to get myself to move, but all of my muscles seized up. That beast, monster, whatever it was, levitated across my motorcraft. The arms lifted this monster and raised it like a divine being. My powerlessness was a mere sneeze to its might. I reckoned the monster was around 20 feet tall, but raised taller than 40 feet when its arms pushed it up. It passed right by me. I shook myself out of my own mental quagmire and finally remembered I had a life to live. After I swallowed the terror that raised in me, I stepped out of the motorcraft with my first leg. It was better to sneak out behind this monster. The moment my boot touched the earth, a creaking echoed from the press of my boot. This monster spun around and its arms crept closer to me. I froze. Should I run? It was not moving towards me, but I started to lose my balance with my other leg. It hits the seat as I tumble back. Those slimy arms flew at me. Dull screeches rattled my eardrums and my back hits the ground ungracefully. That loud, skittering noise consumed every part of my body. My mind was stuck on the merciless choke my throat could not break. All I could do was hear it. I hated the sound the most. My legs got clutched tight and rolled into a knot by a revolting hold. I willed myself to get out of there. But how? That monster's sickening noise roared through my speaker and made my teeth clatter in insanity. My hands grasped my helmet, and I shook my head as if I was shaking off a swarm of bugs. I whipped my hands around as I pulled myself back using my elbows. The monster dragged me closer. Alarms blasted my eardrums as I tried to focus. I screamed and grabbed a rock as it continued to drag me closer. A muddy blob of skin stared down at me. Where in God's name was the face on this thing? I curled my clenched hand over the rock, into the arm around my leg. A loud screech pierced the walls and my ears, but it let me go. I jumped up and ran. My legs kicked aside stones and tumbled me forward at times. I kept running, never looking back. The cries of that beast chased me like a bad dream, but it was starting to fade, even if my fear was not. My breathing got labored almost painful in my rapid gasps. I stopped and looked around. Where was I? 
The lights were not too bright here, so the shadows ruled with an iron fist. I could still make out the shapes of a standing drill, with huge wheels and some flatness. A scattered variety of trowels and concrete slabs laid on the ground near the unused motorcrafts. A distant call for help echoed throughout those caverns. There were so many flashing lights among the indicators and graphics on my helmet screen, yet it was so dark. It was all too confusing. That skittering noise was distant, but I knew that thing was following me. I needed to get out of here. My radio buzzed and beeped, but I ignored that. I glared at the alarms. My hand grabbed the uncomfortable shoulder, and I felt the mangled shoulder plate within its structure. Crap, my suit was compromised, but the damage was only on the surface. I needed to change the suit quickly before the carbon dioxide seeped into the inner layer of the suit. The radio kept beeping, so I turned it on. I turned on my lamp. That scream was too close. A man ran down a corridor several feet from me, but he never got to the other side when a slender arm went right through his suit. I froze in horror as the man screamed. That arm, it was the same arm of that monster. It lifted the man high as his blood dripped onto the floor. The monster moved into the space and revealed its ugly form. As for the pierced man, that arm smacked him onto the rocky floor. His helmet cracked and no sound escaped the unmoving man's body. Not even a scream emanated. That monster pushed that man under it. The monster turned towards me, snapping its arms into the floor and surrounding the walls in some weird reverence. It turned away from me and continued on its way. It didn't see me? My radio crackled and blasted Brady's voice. O'Hara, come in! They're all over the place! O'Hara! In shock, I fumbled the lamp and it hit the ground. I rushed to pick it up and cut off my radio. The low hum of that infernal noise made me swallow the hard lump in my throat. I looked up, and the monster stared in my direction. Hell, I wasn't even sure. It's not like I could see a face or anything. But I could feel it. It was me that it was focused on. The moment it moved towards me, I knew. I almost ran, but I remembered something important. It could not see. The monster's arms snapped and hit the walls and floor as it advanced towards me. Yes, if I stood still and made no sound, it could not find me. There was only one problem with this plan, though. It would run into me eventually if it did not turn away. So that was a risk. That monster got closer, and its looming shadow covered me completely. I glanced at my vitals and noted the temperature rising in my suit. Crap. I jumped to the side. Its arm sliced down and tried to skewer me. I dropped and rolled into a motorcraft. The monster growled, and that skittering sound it made shook my soul and bones to the core. I gripped the side of the motorcraft and pulled myself into it, hitting aside a trowel. After turning it on, three arms pierced into it. Son of a bitch! My hand grabbed a trowel and cut into one of the arms. The monster ah! cried out and bashed the motorcraft. My heart got shell-shocked. I jumped over an arm and dropped into the carriage bay of the standing drill. The seat groaned and the drill got pushed to the side by the mammoth beast. The motorcraft was lifted off the ground as its wheels spun. I stared in awe, but kicked my fascination into high gear as I tried to get to the other side of the carriage bay. The monster ripped the motorcraft in half, and before I could get out, two arms snapped onto the ground and blocked my way. I seized up. Sweat kneared down my face, hitting my eyelid on the way down to my chin. My eyes blinked, trying to get my sight clear. That skittering sent a chill up my spine. Metal snapped, and the glass cracked around me. My body shook when the standing drill platform tilted up. 
I rolled into the cushion and stared over the dashboard. The ugly, sickly surface of that monster moved near the drill's bit as it tried to wrap its arm around the carriage bay. I was being crushed inside here. My elbow hit the dashboard as the seat tightened closer to it. I caught my breath as my face burned under the failing system of my suit. My hand gripped the dashboard and tried climbing out through the front window. An arm thrust into the carriage bay, but I dodged it. My elbow hits a lever, so I retreated inside. The drill looked so appealing to me as I laid there at this monster's mercy. That drill might be the thing to save me. I reached for the dashboard and glanced around at the confusing buttons and knobs. My brain almost short-circuited until I caught sight of the key. I slipped my hand under the hairy arm trying to smack me and turned it. The engine of the drill whirred and roared over the crushing metal of my little cage. I gasped. <gasps> the monster moved to the back of the platform, intrigued by the noise. Shit. I could not kill it now, unless I gave it a louder noise. Brady, tell me, how do I turn on the drill revolution? What? Where the hell are you? We're dying over here and you're- Tell me or I'll die! What? Oh, for real? I felt dread. Hair stood in the back of my neck. I turned my head. An arm rushed past my helmet after I pulled away just in time. Yes, Brady! The faster the better! Pull the REC arm that's next to the steering wheel. The switch is red at the top of the dashboard. The orange knob is a level determinator. If you need it to drop, use a big black lever at the end of the dashboard. I followed the instructions and the drill started spinning. The monster lifted the drill carriage bay and the platform with it. I rolled into the back of the carriage bay, screaming. The drill spun and its caustic screech outstripped the engine. Its noise sent out a ferocious echo in the caverns. I was suspended for a moment and slammed into the seating before I hit the underside of the dashboard. My head raised, and I saw the monster moving to the front. Yes, keep going. I lifted myself and grabbed the black lever. The monster raised its arms towards the drill, but I watched the meaty body those arms were connected to. Once it got under the drill, I pulled the lever. The drill pummeled into the monster and sprayed blood all over the window of the carriage bay and drill platform. Its chaotic scream ruptured the whole cavern. I dropped back and laid in the seat. The drill ground to a screeching halt. Silence crushed my brain until Brady's voice woke me up from the confusion. O'Hara, are you okay? Yeah, I am. I came out of the winding caverns of Mine 15 and reached the gate and pressurization chamber that separated us from those monstrosities. When Brady and the other miners saw me, they had no happy faces. I was covered in blood and a lot of fleshy stuff that I didn't want to think about, much less assume. I entered the pressurization chamber and stood there patiently, as if following the biomedical and viral infestation protocols mattered. After carbon dioxide got absorbed out of the chamber, the disinfecting spray and burning smoke came into the room. Once it cleared, it beeped for the initial filling of oxygen. I immediately pulled off my helmet. The helmet hits the floor and I gasped hungrily to breathe fresh air. The alarms beeped and the glass door pulled down. I pulled off the suit's exoskeleton and inner skeleton too before I walked past the gate. Brady walked up to me. What are we doing? This whole place is overrun with those things. Did you get your people out of the mine? His face dropped. No. Two people are still missing. I already verified four dead. Those animals, whatever they are, they killed them. Dunkley. Well, here's the young chicken head now. I turned around and saw Dunkley carrying an injured worker. After he was cleared and came in, I said, Dunkley. Bring that person over to the medic and come with me. We're going to get better adjusted. Brady, give all of your sub-drillers the Article 6 and get everybody back to the compound. Not one soul should be in these mines. Make sure they're head checked. We're going to lock these gates. I don't know what the hell those are, but you do not let them pass this gate. 
I do not care if you have to ram one of the vehicles into the gate to block it, but you do not let that thing pass this gate. Do you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Don't worry about it. Dunkley and I needed to protect this place. So after I changed my suit, Dunkley and I logged into the safe of our security room. The safe door opened and revealed the laser rifle standing up in the glass case. I said, I never thought this day would come when I would have to use these things. Do you think these guns are going to be effective against those things? I knew little about guns. All I knew was these guns would burn through metal like it was water through a toilet tissue. They better work. I took out the first rifle and handed it to Dunkley. Whoa, sweet! He lifted the laser rifle and admired it. Let's go. We went back to Mine 15, determined to find the last person left inside and lock it down. Two monsters interacted with us on our way through these caverns. The laser gun hurt it, spilling blood, but not to a lethal extent. Those monsters didn't stay though, to get any long-term exposure, and we weren't exactly looking for revenge. Rescuing the last person was the priority. Our adventure did not end with good news though, for that person was dead. My radio was chaotic, with a bunch of people shouting for information or ordering each other around. Walker was constantly asking me to talk to him and explain what was going on. I was going to have to deal with that later. Right now, we knew nothing about these invaders. We knew nothing about where they came from or their goal. That fact worried me. Dunkley, I have an idea. Follow me somewhere and make sure you have my back. We went looking for that monster I killed. Dunkley helped me to cut off one of the arms and we jetted back to the home base. The moment me and Dunkley got back, I got an earful. O'Hara! I saw Walker jogging towards me. O'Hara, what the hell is going on? What was I supposed to say? That I saw a giant monster walking through the caverns, killing and slaughtering people left, right, and center? I tried to collect my thoughts and calm down. Um, we have to send out a distress signal. A lot of people got injured. Some are dead. His face twisted into a nasty scowl. From what? We have an extraterrestrial threat. Walker, get all of your people to the checkpoint, just like we drilled last year. Go. He was about to speak, but I had little patience for an argument. Please, Walker, you're the smartest person in that department. You're the only one who remembers the drill exactly as we did it. You're the best person to lead the team. Can you do this for me? He frowned, but finally, he nodded his head in the affirmative. With his confirmation, I immediately ran off to send out that distress signal. The rest of the day was a mix of chaos and muted terror. Everybody was searching for an explanation, but nobody could give them any. Not even me. All I could tell them was that there was no work going to be done today. A lot of people asked me if we were going to go down for the bodies of their dead friends and colleagues. And my initial answer was we would, just not now. As much as I would, for the sake of my humanity, try to recover them, it was a fool's errand when we knew nothing about those creatures. The Volta's company last sent protocol-based transmissions at least told me that they were going to suspend all shipments and airspace drops onto Mars until they got more information about what was happening. That did not please Walker, and a lot of people, because it sounded like we were being abandoned on Mars. I hoped that was not the case. We needed to sit tight and just hope for a transmission from headquarters. As far as the monster's arm, I decided to bring that to my friend, Mrs. Johnson. I'm so glad you're alive, Scarlet, but what the hell is this? The arm laid between us on the table in our security post, with its hair strands moving in waves. Girl, I have no idea. I'm still as confused as you are. Her face was twisted in disgust. Is it still alive? I shook my head. Trust me, it's dead, Lucy. Maybe it's rigor mortis? I don't know, but I want you to check it out. We don't got a life biologist on the team. It's all chemists and physicists. I can work with a doctor on staff and try and figure it out. But don't expect any miracles. I don't expect all that. All I want to know is what it is and maybe how we could fight it or defeat it or something. Because my rifle barely scratched it. It bleeds a little bit, that's it. Mrs. Johnson slid on gloves. Looking at the exterior of the arm, it looks like hardened skin. It can probably take a lot of abuse. What else? I can't see. 
It was using its arms like a blind man, just hitting the walls and the floor, trying to make sure it was going in the right direction. Blind, huh? Maybe the hair is sensitive and helps pick up on sound waves. I will have to test it. She took up the arm, and her face immediately turned away. Ugh, can we just set up this stuff here? I don't want to contaminate our lab with this thing. Go ahead. The evening of the next day, a transmission came in. Mars Volta Mining Base. Please report in. Mars Volta Mining Base. Please respond back. The radio crackled as I fiddled with the controls of the visor line and its connection strength. Yes? Come in. This is Mars Volta Mining Base, Miss O'Hara. Security officer reporting in. 628 reporting in. Please, can you hear me? O'Hara, okay. So you're the... Could you repeat your occupation, miss? Security officer. She's on the white list? Okay. All good. Good to meet you. My name is Lieutenant Amos of the Space Marine 22nd Regiment. Claymore Platoon. An actual soldier? Well, should I really be that surprised? There were a lot of deceased, and an aggressive threat to our lives. But I didn't expect this incident to be escalated to armed intervention. Part of me was just hoping that they would send an evac to get us out of here. Regardless, I did my best to explain the situation and give him details about where we were currently and our resources. Well, you guys are in quite a pinch. Alright, here's how it's gonna go. We're going to launch in an hour. We'll be on a two-week trajectory to get to you. Once we get to you, we're going to deal with the threat and evacuate you at the same time. But the priority is to get you off that planet so that we can use our weapon systems with a lot more liberty. All you have to do right now is hold it down until we get there. It sounded easy enough for me. So they can't see at all? Yes, I was right in front of it, and it didn't notice me until I moved and made a sound. So I think that's how it hunts, I guess. Alright, you're the only person I'm going to talk to going forward. But just in case, is there a second in command that I can transfer to? Dunkley, he's the guy I work with. Great. Keep me posted on any changes, and keep this connection open. Don't worry. Anything I notice, I'll let you know. Hey, just keep your head up and keep the faith. Don't worry. We're going to come for you guys. We're not going to leave you behind. That was good to hear. And hopefully, the rest of the crew would feel the same way. So I switched over the connection codes to my on-person radio. I told the workers the situation and what's going to happen from now on. There was a lot of relief on many people's faces and a number of muted thanks given. Everybody felt better. And that was good. Two weeks did not seem like a long time. The only problem was the people and I quickly realized that two others were going to make these two weeks feel like 200 years. The next day, a gate was breached by those monsters. We locked down the area connected to it while Dunkley and I warded off the threat of these monsters. We decided to have a meeting immediately after the mishap. Why does the army have to run through you? Walker scowled at me. I looked at Walker with obvious surprise. My lips opened, unsure of how I was going to explain this without ruffling any feathers. Oh my god. Because she's in charge of security? So of course they're gonna go talk to her. I don't see you securing anything. Actually, how fast were you running when you were in the compression dock? Pretty damn fast, huh? Dunkley snickered, and the other workers gave suppressed laughs. Walker frowned at Brady and grunted. I'll have you know I am in charge of this mine. I would like to talk to them directly, to at least get some details on their arrival. Don't worry, Walker. I'm going to call him in a little while and then you can ask whatever question you want. We do have enough food and I think the only problem right now is the gates. We already had to lock down one part of the residential complex because one of the gates were breached. They never made those gates to protect against giant monsters. So we're on borrowed time until they decide to come for us. That's a long two weeks, then. What do you see on the camera? Are they coming for us? I shook my head. No, they're moving around the caverns rather passively right now. There's no organized movements of them towards the gate. The closest gate I can see them near is the gate to the excavator garage. Near mine, number 15? That mine is cursed! I knew nothing about that. All I knew was we needed to protect against any possible breach. Alright, is there a way we can block it or something? We can use the extracted material that we took out of the mines. It's not much, but it can do for now. Walker scoffed. 
that stuff's supposed to be transported back to Earth. You assume we're gonna live that long, dumbass? You're the dumbass. That stuff is mostly softened and broken rock. It's useless as a defense. Here's what I think we need to do. Blow the roof in and shut it down from the inside. Bradley guffawed and doubled over in shock. <laughs> and he says my ideas are a middle finger to safety. Which part of your big head did you dig up that big-brained idea from? I know the mind structure and makeup like the back of my hand. But I'm not a miner. That's your job. I can give you instructions on how to place the implosion charges. And all you have to do is execute. They won't be able to reach us. It sounds like a good idea on the surface, but if we're gonna do this, we have to be careful. These creatures may be blind, but they can still hear us from what I can tell. They're going to hear those charges. Brady gave me a facial shrug. How about some music? Then we blast it. That should distract them. Good idea. I'll get my boys together. And obviously you know what your job's gonna be. That never needed any reminder. So I ran it by the lieutenant and he was fully on board. As long as he was talking to us while we did the deed. Dunkley and I went to mine number one with a small group. Brady and Walker were there, with Lieutenant and Johnson on the radio listening in. Johnson, since she was already in our security room, was put on camera duty to check what was going on in the mines. We worked hard and fast to dig into the walls just outside of the gate with hand drills. It was loud, but we didn't expect them to hear it from this distance. Scarlet! Scarlet! They're coming down Route 186 and 120! Damn, Lucy, you don't gotta shout. Dunkley, keep shop. They're coming. The monsters crawled down the tunnels and fired at them. The lasers cut into their skin and sparks of fire burst up. They cried out with those skittering sounds that chilled my bones. Brady set the charges and called from the inside. Get back! Two minutes to blast! We retreated and the explosions blew in the entrance. There was no way they were going to get through all of that ton of rock. The noise was infectious, though, and I was worried we attracted too much attention. So I called. Lucy, what do you see? Hold on. I looked around at the dust that surrounded me. Dunkley passed me and pulled off his helmet. There was a lot of shouting as Brady ordered his men around. Scarlet! What do you see? She gasped. It's a lot of them. They're coming down Route 152. All right. That's what we expected. Walker, all of them are moving to Mine 1. Do you think we can take out the second gate while they're over here distracted? Yeah, we just have to work quick! The mines are interconnected, so they might come over if they hear the next explosion. In six days, we destroyed five mine gates, and we're about to do the sixth one. The music wasn't doing as good a job of distracting them as we thought it would. That and Walker complained that we were moving too slowly. It wasn't like we were using the more powerful drills because we couldn't, they were too loud. After gate 11 got breached in the night, we had to lock down that area and get any people out that were trapped in there. We needed to move faster. Lieutenant Amos felt that we should keep going at our steady pace, but Walker overruled that directive. Well, he was in charge, but I was worried we would attract too much attention if we used the heavy machinery. The next day, we fired up the motorcrafts to go inside instead of being on foot. The DC-12 factor thundered down the tunnel and went ahead of us. It stopped at the end of the cavern path. O'Hara, they're moving toward you! That was way too fast, and no drilling had occurred yet. The music wasn't even attracting them. The motorcraft shouldn't be that loud to attract them. Well, I don't know. I stared ahead of me. Shadows moved along the ground from around the corners. Dunkley, they're coming. Move the motorcraft to set up cover. The miners moved quicker. Dunkley jumped into the motorcrafts and used them to block the path. I crouched down and pointed my rifle down the line. The monsters, twelve of them, crawled towards us, completely ignoring the miners and the fractor. Either they had a death wish, or they were trying to specifically take my partner and I out because we carried weapons. That didn't matter right now. I fired the laser. It grazed and reflected off of two of the monsters. They screeched and retreated. Then, their arms flew past my head. Christ! I managed to slip below the motorcraft while another monster pushed into the blockage column, as if they were testing its strength. If they knew our blockade was weak, we would have already been overrun. 
I fired again and tried to cut down the monsters in one sweeping line since they were so close together. Their blood splattered onto the cold rock. They screamed and pulled back only for their arms to fly at us. Scraps of metal flew off the motorcrafts when their arms sliced into them. Hey ma'am, maybe I can use the fractor to run them over. Our cover's too slim over here. That assumed he could get there. It was too risky a plan. Stay where you are, Dunkley, and keep up your line of fire. He jumped back from an attacking arm and ducked under another. Dunkley sped forward and ran around a monster. What the hell was he doing? A few monsters swung their arms at him, but he barely tumbled around their strikes. Dunkley, don't- Shit! I walked briskly backwards as the rest of the monsters rolled and climbed over the motorcrafts. Brady called after me. Oh, Hera, damn it! You gotta keep them back! I knew that, but it was going to be hard by myself with so many of them. A plan was needed, but my brain never got a chance to think. For the thundering roar of the fractor. The monsters paused and turned around. Dunkley pummeled into one of the monsters, crunching their arms and the motorcrafts on his way to us. They cried in a ferocious rage as their arms and bodies got crashed. An arm flew into the fractor's back panel. I fidgeted when Dunkley bellowed in pain. The fractor spun to one side and bashed into the wall. My legs wobbled as the chaos of voices consumed the tunnel. O'Hara, what's going on? Dust raised as an arm flew straightened into a spear aimed at me. I fired the laser at it. It hit the monster and forced it to retreat. That was not going to last long, as more arms tapped the top of the fractor. I needed to get to Dunkley. Brady, we're abandoning this. Retreat. Go. What about you and Dunkley? I said go back. I pressed the trigger and the laser let loose its burn as I got close to the fractor. Its spinning wheels were spitting up a wave of stones and its once untroubled dust. I sank below the dust and went for the compartment. An arm swung down at me. A monster was rolling its humongous round body over the fractor's roof. I fired into one arm and blasted it off its body. That skittering cry rattled my bones. I pulled open the door to the compartment. Dunkley laid in the chair. His suit was broken from the meddled series of cracks along the chest to the surface of the helmet. Please tell me he wasn't dead. I grabbed his arm and his other hand gripped my wrist. Yes! Get up, Dunkley. You're not dying here. Dunkley rolled out of the compartment and slumped onto the ground. So many confusing voices ran through my speaker. I ignored them. Dunkley was more important right now. The helmet looked cracked. If you've been compromised, hold your breath and seal off the helmet from your oxygen tank. Dunkley nodded his head. I pulled him up and he stood up with me. More arms crawled around the fractor and the overwhelming shadows of these behemoths crawled along the lumpy ground. I did not dare look up. My heart would jump out of my chest, so I spun the rifle to fire behind me. We walked briskly under the shadow of these monsters. The rifle's energy zlitched to a saddening whimper as it ran out of ammo. Avara! Dunkley! Come on! Walker was still in the tunnel and standing behind a large box in the center of the light. Everyone else was gone. What was he doing here? I told you to leave! Walker pulled up a remote for the charges and pointed above me. Go to the other side! We pulled ourselves up and sped up our run as much as possible. My arm grabbed Dunkley's waist and I rolled to the ground. The charges blasted the immense dust and rocks over us. Alarm shouted to my eardrums from all the rocks falling into my back. It did not seem too detrimental though. I heard Dunkley whizzing through my speaker. Walker, help me get Dunkley up! Walker ran over to us. An arm flew past me and I cut through him. Walker! Walker flew and bashed into the floor. A motorcraft drifted around Walker's unmoving body and spun to a stop next to me. Brady held out his hand from the motorcraft. What are you looking at me for? Get on! I pushed Dunkley on first before I jumped on. Brady spun the motorcraft around as the monsters chased them. He rolled over the uneven ground and chased past the glass of the pressurization chamber. Brady screeched the motorcraft to a stop once we were inside. Shut it down! The alarms burst into the atmosphere, thick with urgency. Brady and I pulled Dunkley off the motorcraft. The riveting sound of the gate pulled down and crunched into the arms of the monsters. They bashed into the gate. 
We carried Dunkley to the infirmary. I didn't even look back at the gate. Dunkley was what mattered to me right now. Sorry, ma'am. I screwed up. I laid my hand on his cracked helmet. You're going to be okay, Dunkley. Just hold on. You're going to be okay. He was taken off by the crew to the doctors. There were a horde of people running around, and these 30-foot-tall, 16-foot-wide corridors were too huge for me to feel so claustrophobic. I failed. O'Hara! Miss O'Hara! Scarlet! My head was a mess, so I took off my helmet to avoid listening to anyone on the radio transmission. I need a second to think. The walk back to the old security post was supposed to be short, but it felt like I walked a mile. Damn it! I couldn't do anything right! As soon as I came in, Lucy jumped up. Scarlet! I nodded my head at her in respect. I'm fine. We didn't get much time to breathe because Brady came in shaking his head at me. Christ, this is ridiculous! A loud bang, followed by that infernal skittering noise, made Brady glance up at me. I didn't know what face he saw when he looked at me, but I knew what my mind was saying. Brady, follow me. I pulled on my helmet and went back down there. The gate was breached and we had to lock them down, plus the surrounding blocks like last time. Either way, we had to deal with the monsters moving lazily inside the compromised blocks of the mining base, and the only thing separating us was thin metal walls. Everything fell apart, and I swore Lieutenant Amos would be mad at me for losing one person and almost losing the other, especially since it was Dunkley. I felt like I failed him. I was supposed to get these people home and alive, and I couldn't even do that right. The lieutenant did not look at it that way. Don't worry about it. You can't hammer yourself up about it. There's no right decision in this world. At least you kept everybody else safe. Yeah, but our plan was good. It was supposed to be good, and now we're stuck here praying they don't breach further into our base. Are they moving now? No. I'm looking at the camera right now. They're not moving. We swore it was the sound that they were attracted to. This may be a monster, but at the end of the day, it's still a living thing, just like us. So I'm sure they have instincts that they survive by, right? Maybe that's why they're attacking so oddly. If you can figure out their patterns, maybe we can stop it. That assumed I could figure that out. But what choice did I have? Even if you say that, I don't know. I mean, all I know is that they attack twice per day, that's all I know. Sounds like a pattern to me. What else? What do they do? I racked my brain, trying to figure out what was the secret to this. Then, it hit me. Son of a- What? It's time. It's always near midday, and the second time is after- Oh my. Hold on. Brady! Lucy! You see Brady? No. Get him down here now! I need to ask him something. You figure something out, O'Hara? I did, but I needed to confirm it, because if this was true, this changes everything. A few moments later, Brady and I walked down the corridor towards the oxygen dilation tank system. You really think this is it? Honestly, it better not be it. But if it is, how long do you feel the oxygen is going to last for us? Brady shook his head in the morbid horror at the thought. Never thought I'd say this, but honestly, I don't even want to know. Neither did I. But here we were, with only a few days left for the lieutenant to come here. This could be the end of us. Another attack would be catastrophic. So I turned off the main power for the system after I refilled all of our emergency oxygen tanks. It should work passively, but with the high tensions, the oxygen would not last long. I asked Lucy to give me a timeline, and it was two days short. On the last day, we had to at least turn it on and hold off the monsters until the extraction team reached us. My hunch was right. It was the vibrations of the oxygen dilation tank. That's what attracted these beasts, and with no significant vibrations in our confines, or dead space of the mines, the monsters became as quiet as mice on Christmas Eve. We waited patiently for Christmas Day, when the space marines would rescue us from this hellhole. Things slowed down, and I kept everybody as calm as possible. Everyone was scared, but talking needed to be kept to a minimum, as did activity. I pretty much told everybody except essential staff to just sleep. Telling scared people to sleep wasn't exactly the advice they wanted to hear, but it did work and gave us one extra day. As for the monsters, we had a plan for them. 
We moved most of the residents and the non-essential workers outside of medical to the parts of the base that were the furthest away from the mines. As for Brady and his boys, Lucy and the important scientists, myself, we were locked down in three blocks where we built defensive positions. The three blocks were the maintenance garage, the block with the security outpost, and the psych ward, which was my last place, with the last place being the A-source storage unit. Our job was simple, to hold off the monsters by any means necessary. Each of the other paths that we expected the monsters to breach through were tagged with traps. Lucy changed the music to a special kind of heavy bass music to confuse them. Hopefully that helped. I told everyone to wear suits, because those blocks we were protecting were going to be compromised with the unfiltered air of Mars. No mistakes could be made. I turned on the oxygen dilation tank the day before the rescuer's arrival. Its shattering shake through the floor made my heart stop. My pulse burst in my head when the alarms blew up. I inhaled and spoke into my radio. Lucy, what do you see? Oh my god, Scarlet, they're moving! I ran to the other side of the base. Brady! He was next to a defensive position we set up some hours before with some men. Took you long enough. Their arms slashed to the entrance of the A6! When I call you, activate the trap, alright? Got it. And don't die on me, O'Hara. I wouldn't dare. I moved quickly in a crouch as I swung around the corner. A thick door stood there, with a myriad of arms pierced through it. I decided to cut them down from the side with my laser. A few arms retracted, while others burnt from the fire that cut into them. Those arms recoiled, and the metal bent inward. The monsters worked together to rip down door after door. Arms snapped into the floor as one of the monsters squeezed through the 15-foot doorway into my path. 18 feet away from me, that monster lifted itself on its burnt arms and moved towards me. A six and a two! Now! The implosion charges blew up from the floor and sent that monster crashing into the roof with a ferocious breath of vaporized matter. It took out the lights nearby, leaving me and much of the corridor in darkness, except for the weaker light sources on the wall. Dust rolled around me as debris rained on my hard exoskeleton. So many cracked plates of the roof fell into the mangled body of that monster. That should block things up. I called Lucy. Hey, Lucy, is the music on? I can't hear a goddamn thing! Oh, you're not going to hear it, since this thing reacts to vibrations. I decided to make it have a high subbational tone. I used the arm you found to test it. Those monsters crawled inside over their dead comrade without a care in their minds. My breath hitched. I paused. It didn't move, least they sense my presence. They looked in my direction before moving towards the garage. Yes, it was working. By now the oxygen dilation tank should finish its recirculating, and the music would take over, leading them to their final resting place, the maintenance garage. Hours passed as we fought off some wayward monsters that broke into the psych ward. Lucy lost her shit and kept screaming into my ears, but I already pushed them back. Lieutenant Amos's ship was almost here. Three hours until arrival. We just needed a little bit more time. The only problem, the oxygen dilation tank would recirculate the filters in two hours. We had to hold on until then. Time passed as I patrolled outside the security post. The paths were empty except for the unmoving arms of the monsters, sitting around in limbo, across from the psych ward. The skittering roared up once the oxygen dilation tank did its thing. Brady, it's time. Get your men up, because they're coming your way right now. Right, I'll hold it down. Scarlet! Scarlet! They're coming! Yes, yes, I know. I'm going now. Those arms retracted from view as the monsters started moving. I intended to follow them and cut them off, then an arm flew over my head. My heart jumped into my throat as I rolled and lifted the rifle. I fired it and cut into its arm before the monster's body squeezed into the corridor and smacked me to the ground. My laser rifle flew out of my hand. Scarlet! The monster pushed up as its arms extended. The back smashed the light in the roof and darkness resumed to take its rightful place. That was when I caught sight of a lump pushing out from under its body. I froze in horror. 
What kind of monstrosity was that? That lump spread out into fangs as the monster crawled over me. There was no way in hell I was going to be eaten. My hands searched for the rifle. Something moved over me. I rolled to the side before an arm stabbed into the floor. Shit! Where was my rifle? Fuck it! I crawled right under it as its arms hit the floor, looking for me. Scarlet! I can't see you! I ran off as the arms clipped the walls. The monster chased me down the corridor and my legs pumped me forwards. Scarlet! I could not respond to her right now. The helmet rattled against my neck. My breath became shorter than my options. Running out of the depths of the darkness and into the shine of the light, I turned down another corridor. It was only then I saw the compartment boxes that I realized I was near the maintenance garage. The monsters cried out from Brady's boy slicing through their ranks. Crap! I looked behind me and saw a huge shadow traveling up the corridor and now the wall. The monster was close. I got no weapon and I was now trapped. My only other choice was to move forwards. Scarlet! I'm alive, Lucy! Stop shouting in my ears! I ain't deaf! I'm patching through Lieutenant Almost to you. He's almost here! Before that, tell Brady and everyone else to fall back. Don't lure the monsters elsewhere. What about you? Patch the Lieutenant through. She grumbled something incoherent before I heard the crackle of static. Miss Ahara, we'll be there in 15 minutes. A lot of monster arms came into crossroads around me. You better make it quick, I'm drowning in sweat here. I needed to move. My feet went on tiptoe as I made swift and light steps around the arms in the closest corner. The monsters rushed forward, but tumbled over each other in their chase of me. I escaped their clutches and reached the inside of the 60 foot tall room of the maintenance garage. It was filled with many old machines and parts sitting on the ground if not hanging from threads. Fractors, trucks, and motorcrafts lingered in a confused maze around walled-off sections where workers would have made their repairs. I found a speaker at the top of a dismantled drill platform in a grilled metal container that was clearly beaten up. Its subwoofer pulled in and out with a fury, even in this silence. The monsters walked around it with their arms raised. Occasionally, those arms struck at the speaker's container. I needed to find a hiding place. A pain raptured through me. My helmet hits the floor, and despite the cushioning around my neck, it did not stop the crack that formed down the middle of the helmet screen. Crap, crap, crap! My hands tried to grab something, but I was pulled like a rag doll. I spun around to see that same monster with that infernal mouth opening over me. I pulled my leg back and swung it into its mouthpiece, soliciting a loud skittering noise. I caught sight of a pointed shard of concrete and thrust it into the mouth. Dark fluid spewed onto my hand. I pulled away and tumbled behind a fractor. Getting my feet off the ground was my best option to avoid them noticing me. So I jumped into the seating of the fractor, just as a monster bashed into it. I screamed out in surprise. My other leg burned immensely from being punctured. Monsters swarmed around the fractor looking for me. One arm taps the front window, trying to figure out if I was in there. I froze. Every part of my body. It hurt so bad. Alarms blasted over my screen, and a crack along my helmet screen worried me. Lucy, what's the least painful death? Being killed by these devils, or breathing carbon dioxide? O'Hara, don't you fucking ask me that! Keep the faith! Faith already left my soul. A loud, crunching noise made my heart sink. Then my torso moved when the seat pushed forward. They're crushing me inside here. Alright, forget my previous idea of not moving. I lifted myself up, and in the brazen shock of the moment, I swear, I saw an angel. But it was only Lieutenant Amos floating down towards me, thanks to the thrusters on his battle armor. Are you hearing me, Miss O'Hara? I tried to keep my voice as steady as possible. I hear you. Come out and move to the side of the vehicle. You crazy, I'm surrounded. He glided over those ugly monsters and never too close to make them feel the tickle of his thrusters. Just trust me, O'Hara. I inhaled and steeled my heartbeat. It was important for me to be as soft in my movements as possible. I moved across the seat and pushed myself out. 
The more I moved back, the bigger the swatch of blood I saw on the seat. A loud thud froze me. I turned around and saw the vehicle door swaying. My bad leg must have hit it. It was an accident, but when I raised my head and saw that beast's muddled face right next to the window across from me, it was clear these monsters didn't accept mistakes. I could just run, but I kept my fear on the back burner and made slow steps down to the floor below me. That skittering buzz infested my mind. I could not see the lieutenant now. My boot touched the floor. My leg hurt worse than hell. I pulled my head past the insertion of the door and saw the other monster five feet from me. It moved its arms and slapped the ground in a hungry attempt to find me. I froze. A rumbling behind me made me shiver. I turned my head and saw through white smoke falling over me. It dissipated quickly, and Lieutenant Amos dropped down to the ground several feet away from the monster. The monster spun and threw its arms at him, but his thrusters sent him back up in the air. It was brief though, and he touched down several feet further back. What was he doing? He should be flying off, but he kept going up and down in quick succession. Was he trying to get himself killed? Regardless, the monster followed him, with the gloomy cries of a cockroach on its deathbed. But Lieutenant Amos kept playing with it. It was only when the other one started following him that I realized Lieutenant Amos' plan. He was luring them from my position. Lieutenant Amos kept playing with them for another minute before he blasted above them. He curved over their oblivious heads and flew towards me. Lift your arms, Ahara! In one fell swoop, he picked me up and flew down a corridor before he slowed his exhaust several feet away from the end. With me in his arms, he carried me out of there and I lost consciousness. My eyes opened, but everything was sandy colored. Where was the crack across my helmet? I moved my hand and touched my face. Oh, I didn't have it on. I turned and saw on the bed alongside me was the closed-eyed Dunkley. I groaned, Hey, who's in here? How long was I out? Where are the resident- uh, uh. My attempt to sit up sent an uncomfortable tremor up the back of my leg. Hey, easy. We're on the ship now. The rest of the citizens, too. We're going to get out of here, don't worry. Dunkley smiled at me as he rubbed his eyes. My despair lifted, seeing Dunkley was better. My head hurts, but we are alive. I never expected this to be my exit plan at all, but a lot of things never went as planned. The leaves of the humongous, 100-foot trees that covered this planet in huge basins shivered in the rising cold air. I stooped below the tall trees and tried my best to keep my presence obscured by the flowing mist of Gliaz. It was one of the planets that once belonged to Earth, but it was not within their hands anymore. This planet was in their hands. They were called the Creans, but I didn't care what their name was, for as far as I was concerned, they were monsters to me. I was going to figure out their game, and we'll be the ones winning it. The communicator chirped in my ears. Captain Dawson, Captain Dawson, come in. The light voice of Martinez called. I held my breath as a tremor passed through me from the shaking ground. It was near. Ms. Martinez took my suppressed breath, high heart rate, and silence to read that I was either already aware of what was close to me, if she already picked it up on the radar, or if they were right on top of me. Several seconds later, I'm under pressure as the darkness rained over me and the whole forest floor. They were right on top of me now. An Ozcar. 
These were the ugly-faced monstrosities that people feared the most. They walked on four legs and looked like an insect, with a head that was bitten up and barfed out by a playful tiger. The only thing distinct was the red orb on its forehead and the wingspan on top of its head. That orb was the last thing I wanted to be in front of. The beam that came out of it burned hotter than a volcano, according to the few survivors from Gliars and the other colony planet these heathens have taken over. The Ozkar thundered over me and through the forest. Its feet crushed ferns, shrubs, and knocked down trees, breaking them at the ends. Resounding groans of the earth depressed under the heavy weight of its feet. The crackling shatter of the wood made me shudder, but I controlled myself and tried not to lose my cool. Just stay still. It wouldn't find me, was what I told myself. The Ozkar passed and left me breathing easier. That was a close call, but it told me one thing. I was getting close to their center of operations. Captain Dawson. I inhaled and shook my head. Martinez, what's my status? Ms. Martinez answered. Okay, I'm glad you're safe. You see my pulse. Sorry, Captain Dawson, but you didn't have your viewer on, so I couldn't see anything. I could only hear what was going on. The suit I had on was built for this mission not only because of the invisibility cloak that it had, but because it was adjusted to be connected to the cruiser and Martinez's watch station. That cruiser was currently in the orbit of Gliars. Martinez was back on Earth. It wasn't only my pulse. This suit was built to read my health, and everything needed for the mission's objectives. So my suit's viewer allowed whatever I saw to be recorded and sent to Martinez in real time. I swallowed a lump knowing this fact. If I died, it didn't matter. They got what they wanted. My viewer was turned on, and I slowly slipped out of cover. I asked, where's my checkpoint? I can only predict it since these freaks are coming from the valley. Martinez was my handler and my only contact off this gloomy planet. I lose her, and I was on my own. Especially with the lack of knowledge that we have on this alien invader, we couldn't risk any more than one secure connection to me. She never lost her step and answered, In the hills, you drop down perfectly, so... Only 800 yards separate you and them. Stick to the river in the valley, and once you get there, you can climb up the hill and you'll see it. I updated your scanner. Just follow the signal. Thanks. Over and out. The last thing we wanted was for them to be tipped to what we were planning. They would only need to hack one, and that would be the end of everything. My commanding officer was telling me some foolishness about him not trusting the other countries meddling with the operation, which was fair. People are scared, and when they get pushed into a corner, they make stupid decisions. I was front and center in a lot of dumb, warring conflicts caused by fear and misunderstanding. Moving from my spot, I got closer and saw more Ozkars. They were going in the same direction the last one went so they're probably all going to the crash site. That pod I came down with buried itself before I left. Let them be confused for the next couple of hours trying to find it. I navigated the moist earth and the immense forest complemented with flowers so bright and leaves wet with the moisture of the absent rain. Soon, I found myself in front of the large, makeshift complex constructed of wood from the forest that surrounded their invasion ship. Their ship looked like a pointed egg, but with panels being pushed out by metal arms from its exterior. It looked like a frightening sight as it stood over every tree. How did all the Oscars fit in that thing? A yelp prompted me to duck behind a tree. My eyes caught sight of a whimpering dog jogging away, 
and Noah's car stepped over the dog and passed me. They didn't touch the animals. Was it because they were not a threat? We were still trying to figure out who these invaders were, and all we knew was that they wanted to destroy us, and they knew us like the back of our hand. Our colonies were taken over effortlessly. They must have been watching us. Well, it was time for them to get watched themselves. I turned on the invisibility cloak, kept low, and moved through the forest line, hugging the complex's border. As an ex-American soldier, I never trusted the army enough to go back into conflict. But as much as I hated war, if the planet was going to be destroyed, what choice did I have? I had to make some effort to stop this disaster from continuing. If I didn't, my family was going to get destroyed with it. And that was not going to happen. The crunching steps of Ozkars shook the earth and rattled my body with a terror uncompromising to the core. Stranger sounds had my head flipping around looking for anything that could be a danger to me. My feet stepped over old scraps of metal from our machines, if not our homes. I caught hills of personal effects from our conquered cities, sitting haphazardly around the tallest building. A tower. The tower had red orbs, rotated in huge, semicircular metal shields, and I hoped they weren't some type of thermographic camera. My eyes shifted to the makeshift hills of books, electronics, and clothes. Most were partially burned. Such was the cruelty of war. I was used to this, but I thought I was done with this business. I stepped over a broken dole and passed the tower. My legs were tense as I slipped down a narrow corridor with glossy tiles and came out into a patchy grass field. War raged on Earth between the conglomerate of countries under the Global Hores Network, or GHN for short, who have been fighting against the Rebel Alliance. I was now working for the combined forces of them. There was no way they were going to go at each other's necks when a stronger enemy was on the horizon. My target was to find information, but I was going in blind. What did we know? Nothing. All we had were the accounts of people that escaped the wrath of these invaders. Our telescopes provided some idea of their military installments and expansion across the planet's surface. This place was deemed the most travelled and was the centre of their operations. As I got deeper into their grounds, the tall structures with wooden bases but metal fastenings were built with such intricate craft and meticulousness. Some structures were still being built by Uzkars, grabbing, cutting, and refining pieces of lumber. That was when I saw them. One of the escaped persons told us about them. A Crean. Unlike the ugly, insect-looking Uzkar, the Crean was more humanoid. They were as big as our tallest humans, but they wore bulky black suits with faceless helmets and carried guns larger than life. A single red orb shined in the center of the helmet. I spoke. Martinez. You see this? Yes, Captain Dawson. Still surprising to me. They don't look that dangerous to me. I would have said that myself, but looks can be deceiving. Getting this far meant their security didn't pick up any heat signatures or high-frequency signals, which was great for us. They weren't perfect and complacent in that area. Was it arrogance, maybe? That would be revealed soon enough. I laid listening devices onto the wall. They pierced and snapped into the surface. The Creans watched over the Uzkars hard at work. It looked like they were already planning to settle on this planet, but I wanted to see if they were plans, weapons I could see, and any secrets I could find out. Were they planning to leave this rock soon, and when? These were questions everybody wanted to know, and I was the only man that could get it for them. 
In the shadow of a structure, I peeked at a crean moving across an intersection and into the center of the complex where a lot of construction was going on. It was best to stay away from the center and stay on the borders of this place. A thud piqued my attention, but as I turned around, a crean stood right over me. I stiffened in fright. The crean was holding a large container. My heart jumped into my throat as I backpedaled. The crean moved towards me. A rock moved as my boot hits it. The crean stopped and turned its head toward the rock. I froze. Please tell me I did not get this far just to get caught right now. The crean moved around me and toward the rock, making a momentary glance at it before looking up and going around me. My throat relaxed. I was safe. For now. My head flipped around to make sure I was good to move. I wasn't used to moving around invisible like this. Got to remember to look before I walk. Lost in the shadows, I followed the Crean carrying that container. Because if they had storage, I wanted to get an idea of where they stored anything. Keeping my distance, we reached the edge of an interesting building. Smaller, but wider. The center of which a hole rested. Around it, Ozkars slept in an akimbo posture. There were a lot more Creans moving containers from what looked like a circular elevator on an edge of the hole. That hole must be an entrance to an underground bunker. If they had food stores or even weapons, they were probably being stored down there. Good. I hoped Martinez was getting this through my viewer. Their vocal language was a lot more interesting, but I couldn't decipher it. I looked around and hoped no one was close enough to expose me. A loud, whooshing roar had me shivering. That sound dissipated as the grinding hovercraft's engine slowed to a stop ten yards away. My eyes widened, not because Creans didn't react to it, outside of stepping back to give it space to park itself close to the entrance. It was because it was a human vehicle. Did they steal it? I did see stolen objects from the human settlements they conquered, but if they were commandeering our vehicles, that was going to be a concern. Creans gathered in closer proximity to the craft that soon lowered itself to the ground. I waited. Three new figures came out of the craft and into the room. As my eyes zeroed upon them, I couldn't help the sinking familiarity of them. These couldn't be Creans either. They were too skinny and short. Creans towered at six feet or more. I should know, because I saw one far too close for comfort, in my opinion, several minutes ago. They were talking, and from the gestures of the hands and body, it looked more like an argument. Each group was on either side, like an invisible wall partitioned them, and little effort was made to quell their war of words. It wasn't the fact that they were arguing that was interesting to me. It was the sound of their voices. A Crean's natural voice was akin to the strum of a well-tuned guitar, but the voices of the new visitors were dead and void of any warmth. It sounded like a cheap artificial intelligence robot I would buy at a corner shop. My heart thumped in my chest, trying to escape this claustrophobic cage. This couldn't be real. But here I was suppressing my thoughts for the sake of giving the benefit of the doubt to what I was witnessing. I held my breath and hoped I was wrong, that my skeptical mind was playing tricks on me. It was the one time in my life that I hoped that humanity would prove me a liar. A war dog was never wrong, though. One of the new entrants took off his helmet. And that was the end of my whirling thoughts, because those thoughts froze. My heart stopped. Everything became dark as I stared at the shameful sight. My fist clenched tight in fury. The man who took off his helmet 
was human. Human beings were standing in non-confrontational discussion with the enemy. It sickened me to my stomach. Didn't they know how many human beings died? How many were killed? Trampled and burned to a crisp by their alien friends? Or did they not care? I continued watching the discussion. That human reached inside one of the containers next to him and took out a tree root I have never seen before. This must have been from the Creans planet. The human ate a piece of it. These bastards were betraying us for food? My teeth almost clattered into each other in unfettered rage. This couldn't be real. But I pushed down my desire to rush out and throttle these traitors. Even if I wanted to, I didn't have any weapons outside of a blaster pistol. With all of these Creans, it would be a suicide mission. And besides, I didn't want to tip off that we knew they were cooperating behind our backs. Their ignorance was going to be our strength. It still infuriated me though. The Creans kept up the aggression, while the human who took off his helmet just watched as his comrades talked to the aliens. Did he remove the vocal device? It must be in the helmet then, so that's how they were translating. It was a possibility, and as my eyes focused on that helmet, a clank emitted. My eyes shot up to see the elevator come up with a set of Creans and goods. One Creon stood apart from the rest, with a shiny purple coat that reflected the light around it with such a glare. The suit had a large pack on its back, and a series of coloured tiny emblems crossing the neckline of it. This Creon was different, and the moment he stepped between the two arguing parties, they silenced their quibble. The human who took off his helmet immediately put it on, and all the humans and Creans straightened up like a bunch of school children around the principal. I knew who had the power in this relationship. The Crean leader, I assumed, in his glossy purple armor, gestured to the humans and spoke briefly. A Crean reached into another container and took out a gun, one unfamiliar to me. Of course, weapons were part of the deal too. What did the humans offer? Cardboard boxes of paper, documents from what I could see. I wished I could get closer and see the contents, but that was too risky. These boxes of documents were soon taken down the hole and out of sight, never to see the light again. The Crean leader walked off with a strut, and his bodyguards kept in lockstep close behind their leader. The humans took the containers and jumped into the hovercraft. Once it pulled out, the Creans went back to their duties. I needed that helmet. Having a key to the Crean language would be a game changer for us. These bastards stabbed us in the back and betrayed us. No wonder the aliens had so much success, because they were getting guidance from our own people. Why would they do this? But even more than that, what would they gain? It didn't make any sense, but this was what I was seeing right in front of me. This had to be true. There was no way around it. I turned and walked around the pillar. After slipping under an Ozkar, I made my way to the border of this place. The shrubs were my saviour. <laughs> I said, Martinez, did you see that? Captain Dawson, I don't know what you expect me to say. I was hoping you could explain it to me. If it smells like it, it's probably it. I gotta ask, we're the only ones on this connection, yeah? Yes, Captain Dawson. What are you suggesting? That my superior was right. But about who? I knew they were humans, but I didn't know what country they flew or which side they were on. If these aliens were being helped by our own, then the best way to take them down was their resource. Us. Look, Martinez... I'm going to follow these guys, and I need you to do something. Get access to line route listings. Whoever these guys are, they must have come off a coordinated route to get here. Well, they were already here. Either way, there must have been a ship that came within Gliaz's aerospace. Can you get me the nationality of any of those ships? She hesitated and groaned incoherently. 
my forehead darkened from the burn. Martinez, can you do it? Yes, sir. I exhaled with relief. All right. The invisibility cloak is working well for me. I don't have to use my other tools. They're not equipped to screen for that. So mark that down for command to know. Got it, Captain Dawson. For now, I need to follow those humans. How those traitors even communicated with them was amazing. If I captured one of the humans, I could definitely ask. It was a risky proposition, though. Getting back to the area, I hid behind a building and peeked out at the human's hovercraft. I gritted my teeth. It was going to be annoying trying to stop a moving vehicle, plus I didn't know how fast it was. But I already knew the possible path outside of the base. Since it was a low ground hovercraft, I could cut it off some distance from the entrance. I reached outside of the base as quickly as I could, and thankfully the humans weren't in a hurry to leave. By the time I reached next to a cluster of trees, I picked a spot where the Kreans would not see my attempt to ride the back of the craft. I looked up the incline to see the hovercraft loitering at the Kreans base opening. No mistake could be made. So I bided my time until it drove down the path. It came out of the reaches of the base. I ran forward and as it passed, I grasped onto the back of the craft. My fingers tightened onto the bars curving around the cold surface of the hovercraft, but the loud cries of Kreans sent a frigid chill up the spine of my body. A Crean vehicle slipped in behind ours and stared at me with its ugly face, a disgrace to my eyes. This wasn't good. I tried to move, but an energy blast scorched the craft next to mine. Sparks spat on my hand and burnt through the armor of my suit. My desperate grasp failed and I had to release it. I rolled into the jungle like a discarded wild hog. The alarms from the suit blared in my head, but I ignored those and got up. I ran further into the forest and once I slowed to a crawl, my head pounded its complaint as I caught my breath. My tongue tasted bitter as the forest became quiet. Captain Dawson, what happened? Her voice crackled as the connection tried to overcome its problems. Martinez, I asked in a low tone. My suit must have been damaged, or there could have been something affecting the signal. Captain Dawson, are you compromised? The signal has been sent to the cruiser, sitting off the orbit to abort the mission. They're going to leave me stranded on this planet. I wasn't even surprised, but my anger could take a back seat for now. I needed to escape this rock. How long? I asked as I stomped through the cold grasp of the forest. Captain Dawson, hold on. Where's your position? Because I'm getting incomplete data from you. Something is wrong with the transfer of data. I looked around. The hovercraft had already left my sight, but nothing moved around me. No animal or sound was heard. It was too quiet. Captain Dawson, answer me. The connection was getting worse. My eyes settled on the spot in the forest where my pod was buried. I'm around 500 yards from my escape route. I'm leaving. Prepare for my docking in one hour. You better get there in 30 minutes. They can't stay there for you much longer. They never had my back in the first place. I would be lucky to not get court-martialed when I got back. A blast of fire ripped through the earth in front of me. I spun on my heel without even looking. For as soon as I hopped around the tree, it fell, as an Ozkar powered into the space behind me, its red orb glowing bright and ready to cut me down into black soot. I needed to get under it, so I doubled back and slid under another blast of its beam. My legs gained the vigor of what life I had left to live, and I sped into the forest with a myriad of wildfires burning the forest into its charred leaves and melted earth. The Ozkars moved around the trees, their creaks as they bent over in the trawling march of the Ozkars. I moved around a tree and I froze right in front of an Ozkar. It didn't move, and neither did I, but the rustled bushes next to me shouted my presence. That red orb glowed as the Ozkar pulled its head back. I ran like a frightened insect. The Ozkar blasted its beam, shattering trees down in front of me, cutting them into red and wood. 
A cry ripped through my soul and a fox-like mammal flew out of the upheaved shrubs with only its torso left. The decapitated body slammed into the crater the beam created. Flickers of flames fell onto me, rolled down my cloaked suit, and showed my shape. Once the Ozka saw me, it fired again. I rolled, and the blast shot up around me. Dust and tiny stones rained from the upturned earth. I dropped a hammer of energy into my legs and jumped into a sprint. It was indiscriminate. They were blasting anything that moved or looked like it was moving. My best option wasn't to hide, but to keep my distance, so my path was as wide of their beams as possible. I ran through the forest's edge. My breath struggled with each pounding step. I couldn't see a thing through the passing leaves and branches. My feet slipped, so I reached and grabbed a branch. It broke, sending me back first into the rocks. I groaned in annoyance, but remembered the situation I was in, so I whirled onto my knees and glanced around for any dangers. Nothing was nearby. The disconcerting sounds of the forest burning before the might of the Ozkars rattled me. I inhaled and swallowed as I gathered my breath. They sought me out, but there was no way they were going to find me looking at a distance of hundred yards between me and their matching troop. I kept low and used my cloak to my advantage. If they can't see me, and I didn't move, they couldn't pick up my location. Once they were gone, I could sneak back to my ship and get out of there. Captain Dawson, I've got some information for you. I breathed out in exhaustion. My body creaked to the rigor of everything. Let me know what it is. I have one rebel ship that has gone off with it. No information has been forthcoming on their whereabouts. Sweat came down my flushed face. The rebels will do anything to win, I suppose. Do you really think they were involved? Martinez said. I... I don't know. Martinez said. You've got to get back, and then we can talk about this with command. The Ozkars were distant dots now. It was time to move. I breathed out and shook off the rust, leaves and dust as I stood tall. A Korean vehicle crashed into a tree, toppling it over, and screeched to a spot twenty yards away. Koreans came out, and I crouched back down. They came out with purpose, flipping their heads around the forest, obviously looking for me. I shuddered when I saw a human tool. A spectrum scanner. That was the thing that could have dug me out of my hole. It could pick invisibility cloaks. I backpedaled, and a snap cried into the air from the fallen branch I stepped on. The Kreans shot their head in my direction. I had the worst luck. Freezing, I stayed still, hoping they would look away. At least, that was what I hoped. But when I was backed into a corner, what did I have? One Crean said something aggressively to the others, and they moved closer to my location. I pulled out my blaster pistol. They crept closer, and raised their guns ready to fire at anything that moved. Namely, me. One Crean was using the spectrum scanner, but not in my direction. Their cries came out like hisses. My leg muscles tightened on the assumption I was going to jump into action. A beep was heard. One of the Creans stopped, and its head tilted. That Crean spoke in a low voice before it cried out louder to its comrades. They all stopped, turned around, and headed back to their vehicle. After the hatch closed and it sped off, I breathed out a sigh of relief. That was way too many close calls for a lifetime. I waited a few minutes and finally mustered up the courage to walk the final stretch of distance to the crash site. Slipping under the wide expanse of greenery, I reached the edge of where my pod was hidden. There was nothing around me, so I was in the clear. I did it. I was now home, free. After I pressed the button on my wrist control, the earth above the pod spurted out in a wave as the pod spun out of the ground. One step was made by me, before the ship got blasted into a burst of flying metal and stones. A 
I was thrown back into the crowded forest floor. No, it couldn't be. I spun around to get up. A red burning blast soared over my head and cut through the trees behind me. I dropped low and ran around the Oscar and falling trees crashing into the dirt. Feathers spurted out from the charred remains of birds. I ducked under a trunk that spun at me, and as I jumped over another fallen tree, my ankle caught on a rock, toppling me. I gritted my teeth, the dust raining down upon me. It thinned into specks and revealed Creans aiming guns at me. Captain Dawson. I breathed out. My heart pounded in my head as I squeezed my eyes shut to settle down the rage. This wasn't going to make me beg for mercy. Martinez, you're seeing what I'm seeing, right? Yes, Captain. Her voice cracked. Oscars appeared behind the Creans. The Creans primed their weapons, for they clicked and screeched their war readiness at me. Remember what you saw. Remember all of these faces, I said. The Oscars orb glowed and its light blinded me, burning me into the history books. The evening was serene, a calm painting of pink and orange hues reflected in the glassy surface of the Pasadena Lake. A gentle wind rustled through the leaves of the sparse trees that peppered the town's outskirts. It was the kind of tranquility that Sheriff Jack Holliday had sought after the blood and fury of war. His sun-weathered skin and the gray streaks in his hair were both testaments to the life he'd lived, a life he hoped to leave behind. Yet as he watched the town from his modest sheriff's office, something gnawed at the pit of his stomach, an unnerving sense of impending doom. He shrugged it off as the remnants of old war wounds, both physical and psychological. He sipped his lukewarm coffee, letting the bitter taste ground him back to reality. This was Pasadena, not some godforsaken war-torn nation. His peace was broken by a loud crash that shook the ground beneath him. The sound echoed off the nearby factories and industrial buildings, reverberating through the bones of the town. Jack sprang to his feet, his instinct kicking in. He was out the door in a heartbeat, driving towards the sound in his rusted police cruiser, siren wailing against the quiet backdrop of the Texas night. As he drove, he noticed a plume of smoke billowing towards the sky on the horizon. His grip tightened around the steering wheel. The smoke, against the backdrop of the evening sun, created an eerie image that sent a chill down his spine. He pulled up at the edge of a large impact crater. He stepped out of the cruiser, a .38 special clutched in his steady hands. It was a scene straight from a science fiction movie. An object, charred and smoky, lay in the center of the crater. It was unlike anything he had ever seen. Not a plane, not a satellite. It was alien. His heart pounded in his chest as he approached the object. Each step echoed in the silent night, the only sounds being the distant hum of the town and his own steady breaths. His fingers brushed against the surface of the object. It was cold, smoother than any material he knew. His mind raced, churning with questions. What was this? Where did it come from? His time in the Navy hadn't prepared him for this. Nothing could. He looked up, noticing for the first time the complete silence that had fallen over the area. No birds, no insects, just the sound of his own breath. It was as if nature itself held its breath in the presence of the strange object. Before he could ponder more, his radio crackled to life, breaking the eerie silence. Sheriff Holiday, come in. You there, Jack? It was Maggie, the dispatcher. Roger that, Maggie, he responded, his voice steady despite the adrenaline coursing through his veins. He didn't take his eyes off the object. Jack, folks are scared. Phone lines are buzzing. They heard the crash, saw the smoke. What's going on? He hesitated, taking one last look at the enigmatic object. Not sure yet, Mags, but tell him to stay put. I'll handle it. The words were spoken with a false bravado he didn't feel. For the first time in a long time, Jack Holliday was unsure. Something had landed in Pasadena, something beyond his understanding. But he was the sheriff, the town's protector. He would face this unknown, just as he had faced the horrors of war. Little did he know the war was just beginning. 
The following days brought about a chilling unease in Pasadena. Murmurs of the mysterious object permeated every corner of the town, from the diner to the town's old church. Jack found himself amidst a whirlwind of questions he had no answers to. The object remained where it had landed, cordoned off as the military and federal agencies promised to handle it. But the crash wasn't the only anomaly disturbing the tranquility of Pasadena. People started disappearing. First, it was Old Man Jenkins, the reclusive widower who lived on the outskirts of town. Then, the Thompson twins didn't show up at school. Panic seeped into the town like a slow, insidious poison. Jack, along with his small team, was stretched thin, trying to maintain a semblance of order. Jack spent his days patrolling the town, answering panicked phone calls, and his nights driving past the increasingly desolate homes of the missing people. Each vacant house was a stark reminder of the growing problem, a problem he was ill-equipped to solve. In the midst of this, he found himself drawn back to the crash site, the place where the tranquility of his town had been shattered. The military had set up a makeshift camp around the object, their activities hidden behind the fences and armed guards. Each visit increased his frustration, the condescending reassurances of the federal agents doing nothing to ease his worries. Jack knew the town, its people, and he knew something was profoundly wrong. He didn't believe in coincidences, and the missing folks in the alien object were surely connected. As he drove away from the site one evening, he caught sight of a solitary figure near the lake. He recognized her instantly. Dr. Emma Lawson. She was a puzzle, an enigma that had landed in their town a few years ago with her fancy degrees and far-off gaze. He parked his cruiser and walked towards her, a peculiar sense of relief washing over him. In a town spiraling into chaos, Emma remained a constant, lost in her world of stars and galaxies. He often envied her for that. Evening, Doc, he greeted as he approached her. She was fiddling with a large telescope, her brows furrowed in concentration. Sheriff Holiday, she acknowledged without taking her eyes off the device. After a moment, she straightened up and glanced at him. I heard about the missing people. Jack nodded, his gaze falling on the tranquil lake. Five and three days. The town's scared, Doc. He could see her calculating mind at work as she processed the information. Then she turned to her telescope, adjusting the lens. I heard about the crash, too, she said, her tone casual. Too casual. Jack raised an eyebrow, looking at her in surprise. She continued to adjust her telescope, finally seeming satisfied. She moved back, gesturing for him to take a look. Hesitant, he stepped forward, peering into the eyepiece. The object was in clear view, its sleek, otherworldly surface shining under the setting sun. He felt a shiver of dread run down his spine as he looked at it. An alien object in his town, the symbol of his worst fears. He stepped back, glancing at Emma. She was watching him, her green eyes serious. I've been picking up strange signals since it crashed she confessed. I think it's connected, Jack. The disappearances, the object. We might be facing something. Extraterrestrial. The finality of her words sent a chill down his spine. He felt the weight of his badge against his chest, the duty it symbolized. He was the protector of the town, and now he had to confront the unknown. He turned his gaze back to the mysterious object, its image reflected in the calm waters of the lake. The once serene town of Pasadena was on the brink of an unimaginable nightmare, and he was standing right at the precipice. Then we better figure out what we're dealing with, Doc, he said, a grim resolve hardening his features. The ordinary town sheriff was about to face an extraordinary threat, and he had no choice but to meet it head on. In the heart of Pasadena, nestled between the town's clinic and the school, was the old St. Jude's Church. Father Michael, its shepherd for three decades, had borne witness to the town's joys and sorrows, baptisms and funerals, weddings and confessions. He was a man of faith, a faith tested now more than ever. The disappearances had the whole town on edge, and the church had become a refuge for many seeking solace. Father Michael shouldered their fear and uncertainty, offering words of comfort despite the growing dread within him. One evening, as the sun was painting the sky in shades of orange, Sheriff Holiday walked into the church. Father Michael noticed the worry lines etched deeper into Jack's forehead. 
the tension in his broad shoulders. Jack was not a regular at St. Jude at the S. His faith had been lost somewhere in the battlefield long ago. And yet here he was, his presence betraying the gravity of the situation. Sheriff, Father Michael greeted him, his voice echoing in the near-empty church. Father, Jack nodded, taking a seat in the front pew. He was silent for a while, as if collecting his thoughts. What brings you here, Jack? Father Michael asked, sitting next to him. Jack ran a hand through his graying hair, his gaze fixed on the large wooden cross adorning the church. I'm not sure, Father, he admitted. This town's in chaos, people are scared, and I can't shake off this feeling of dread. Father Michael studied the sheriff, the burden he was carrying. The church was meant to be a symbol of hope, but what could it offer when the threat was of unknown origin? I've been having dreams, Sheriff, Father Michael confessed. Apocalyptic visions of our town, our people consumed by something unnatural, something unholy. The confession hung heavily in the air between them, an unlikely alliance forming amidst the crisis, the faithless sheriff and the fearful priest, both grappling with the unknown. Outside the church, the world was quickly spinning out of control. Emma Lawson was knee-deep in signals and frequencies, each more perplexing than the last. Her lab was filled with scribbled papers and coffee cups, a telltale sign to her relentless pursuit of answers. She was often solitary, preferring the company of stars and telescopes. But even she could feel the collective fear looming over Pasadena. The strange object had become the focal point of her investigation. She spent hours observing it, tracking its signals. A pattern had begun to emerge, a sort of pulsating rhythm that felt unnervingly alive. Emma was certain it was a form of communication, a chilling message from an alien entity. She shared her findings with Jack when he paid her a visit. Her lab was a stark contrast to the organized chaos of the sheriff's office, filled with complicated machinery and star charts. She showed him the signals, the repeating pattern, her theories about the alien object. Jack listened, his worry lines deepening with every revelation. The meeting ended with more questions than answers, the enormity of the situation settling in. Jack left with a heavy heart, the image of the pulsating signals etched into his mind. He drove back to the sheriff's office, the quiet town around him cloaked in an impending doom. That night, Pasadena fell into an uneasy sleep, the mystery of the alien object hanging over it like a grim shadow. The once vibrant town was losing its colors, succumbing to the fear of the unknown. Jack Holliday, Emma Lawson, and Father Michael were in the eye of the storm, each confronting the crisis in their own way. The alien entity remained a silent observer, its pulsating signals the only hint of the chilling horror that was about to unfold. The people of Pasadena, their world teetering on the edge of darkness, could only brace for what was coming. With the sun rising the next day, a silent gloom seeped into the crevices of the town. The ordinarily bustling diner was mostly deserted, save for a few weary souls seeking solace in steaming cups of coffee. The sheriff's office was awash with activity, the ringing phones a harsh reminder of the growing panic. Jack Holliday, a robust figure of strength and security, had been reduced to a harrowed vessel of worry. The number of missing people had risen to twelve. The fear was palpable, a ghastly specter haunting every street, every home. On the outskirts of town, in a cabin overlooking the lake, Emma Lawson wrestled with the signals. They'd grown stronger, more persistent. The pulsating rhythm felt like a heartbeat, the life force of the alien entity making its presence known. Jack arrived at her cabin early in the day, a map of Pasadena in his hands. Together, they tried to correlate the locations of the disappearances with the frequency of the signals. The task was daunting, the results inconclusive, but it was a start. Amid the fear and uncertainty, they found a common ground, an unexpected partnership. In the evening, Jack was called to the church. Father Michael had found something unusual. The priest led him to the church's basement, a dusty, forgotten place filled with old records and relics. Among them was an ancient text, a chronicle of the town's history spanning centuries. What Father Michael revealed sent a shiver down Jack's spine. There were accounts from the early settlers, tales of disappearances and strange sightings. They were dismissed as folk tales, but now, with the alien object and missing people, they took on a more sinister connotation. 
An old sketch depicted an object remarkably similar to the one that had crashed. Jack left the church, the weight of the discovery hanging heavily on him. Was it possible that they were not the first ones to encounter the entity? The thought was unsettling. That night, the quiet was shattered by an unearthly sound. It started as a low hum, rising gradually into a high-pitched wail that echoed through the town. Lights flickered, car alarms went off, and the people of Pasadena were jolted from their sleep. The sound seemed to emanate from the alien object. The military camp was thrown into chaos, soldiers scrambling to determine the cause. Emma Lawson, listening to the sound from her cabin, recognized it instantly. It was the same frequency she had been observing, amplified and twisted into a chilling scream. A sense of dread washed over her. The alien entity was no longer passive. The horrifying realization struck her. The sound was not just a signal, it was a call. In the heart of the town, Jack Holliday received frantic calls, his town now in the grip of an alien horror. He knew he had to act to protect his people, but how does one fight an unseen, unheard enemy? The sound ended abruptly, leaving a disquieting silence in its wake. Pasadena, under the veil of darkness, was a town under siege. Its protector, Sheriff Jack Holliday, felt an immense responsibility. But standing against the alien threat, he also felt an overpowering fear. His town, his people were on the brink of a dark abyss, and he was their last line of defense. The sinister dance with the alien entity had begun in earnest. It was no longer a question of if, but when the entity would make its next move. The people of Pasadena, tangled in a terrifying ordeal, held their breath, waiting for the inevitable. For the first time in his life, Sheriff Holliday was unsure if he could protect his town, his home, from the alien horror that had descended upon them. The sun rose over Pasadena, casting long, somber shadows over the sleeping town. It was a new day, but the chilling echoes of the alien call from the previous night hung in the air, an ominous portent of things to come. Emma Lawson was already awake, her tired eyes staring at the spectral analysis of the alien sound. It was haunting, the chaotic cacophony now revealing intricate patterns, oscillations that felt unnaturally precise. There was intelligence behind it, something aware and sentient. As Emma delved deeper, a chilling possibility dawned upon her. The signal was not just a call, but could be a command. A countdown, each pulse a ticking clock towards an unknown event. At the sheriff's office, Jack was staring at a map of Pasadena, each red dot marking a disappearance. They clustered around the crash site, radiating outwards, an insidious sprawl of dread. He was piecing together a grim jigsaw, each piece pulling him further into the abyss. His thoughts were interrupted by a knock. Father Michael stood at the doorway, holding a weathered book. It was the town's chronicle, filled with cryptic sketches and old tales. He had found another entry, a forgotten tale of a dark winter when the town had been on the brink of devastation, much like now. In the tale, a wise woman had claimed to commune with the alien entity, understanding its desires. She described it as a consumer of life, a devourer of worlds. As Jack read the account, he felt a chill crawl up his spine. Was their town destined to be consumed? Meanwhile, the military was preparing for the worst. Soldiers patrolled the streets. A perimeter was established around the town, cutting Pasadena off from the outside world. The town was now a ticking time bomb, its fate intertwined with the alien entity's next move. At dusk, Jack found himself at Emma's cabin. He relayed Father Michael's discovery, the Chronicle's tales, the woman who claimed to understand the alien entity. Emma, still engrossed in the signals, paused and looked up at him. They sat in silence, processing the implications. Emma returned to her work, her hands tracing the pattern of the alien signal. The rhythm was hypnotic, a symphony of cosmic horror. Each pulse was a second closer to an event, an unknown catastrophe. That's when she realized the signal wasn't just a countdown. It was also a locator. The entity wasn't just calling, it was guiding others to them. The realization was a blow, a dreadful piece of the puzzle falling into place. They were not only on a ticking clock, but at the epicenter of a coming storm. Emma shared her findings with Jack, the weight of their discovery turning the room cold. Outside, the sun had set, the quiet town now wrapped in the shroud of night. 
An eerie calm had descended, the silence before the storm. Jack and Emma sat in the cabin, their minds racing with the grim truth. The alien entity had woven a terrifying web around Pasadena, and they were at its center. That night, Pasadena slept in the grip of an alien terror. The reality of their situation was sinking in, the fear becoming tangible. The countdown was on, each passing moment bringing them closer to the event horizon. Jack Holliday and Emma Lawson, unlikely partners in this ordeal, were now the town's only hope against the encroaching darkness. Unseen by them, in the cold depths of space, the first of the summoned were beginning their descent. A pall of unease had fallen over Pasadena, a suffocating blanket of fear. The townsfolk whispered of shadows moving in the night, of ghostly sounds, of nightmares that wouldn't end when they woke. The world they knew was being slowly unmade, replaced by an alien terror. In the isolation of her cabin, Emma Lawson had traced the signal to its source. But what she found made her blood run cold. The signal was drawing something towards them from the cold depths of space, an entity far more colossal than the vessel in the town center. In the town center, the military were tense, their faces betraying the strain. There was a sense of the inevitable, a feeling of an impending storm. Whispers floated among them of the disappearances, of the alien signal, of the unknown that lurked in the shadows. At the sheriff's office, Jack Holliday stared at the Chronicle, its ancient pages filled with dread. Father Michael's account of the wise woman who had faced the entity in the past was haunting him. Her words, a consumer of life, a devourer of worlds, echoed in his mind. A chill ran down his spine as he connected the dots, the truth revealing itself in a terrifying vision. His fear turned to determination. He would not let Pasadena fall to this cosmic horror. With renewed vigor, he sought Emma. Their combined knowledge was the only weapon they had. Meanwhile, in the seclusion of her cabin, Emma tracked the alien signal, her heart pounding in her chest. As she followed the pulsating rhythm, the locator coordinates pointed to a horrifying truth. The first of the summoned had arrived. She found Jack at her doorstep, his face etched with worry. They shared their findings, their theories converging on a nightmarish conclusion. The summoned entity had arrived and was hidden somewhere in town, waiting for the right moment to reveal itself. Armed with this knowledge, Jack and Emma turned to the military. They presented their findings to Captain Anderson, the raw fear apparent in their voices. The captain, a man who had faced countless battles, blanched at their words. The reality of their predicament sunk in. This was a war unlike any he had fought before. Without wasting time, a townwide search was initiated. Every home, every alley, every corner was scoured for signs of the alien entity. The tension was high, the air heavy with the fear of the unknown. In the dead of night, beneath the hollow gaze of the alien vessel, the ground began to tremble. A low hum vibrated through the air, matching the frequency of the alien signal. Emma, standing at a distance, recognized it instantly. The entity was about to reveal itself. Then it emerged. From the shadows of the lake, a colossal figure materialized. It was unlike anything they had ever seen. Its form fluctuating, a being of pure energy and darkness. It pulsed with the same rhythm as the alien signal. The sight was terrifying. The military opened fire, but their weapons were useless against it. The entity moved, its form flowing like water, consuming everything in its path. Pasadena was plunged into darkness, its heart now home to an alien entity. Jack and Emma could only watch, the horror unfolding before their eyes surpassing their darkest fears. The once peaceful town of Pasadena was now a theater of chaos and destruction. The alien entity had revealed itself, a living shadow that abs vesseled life and light. Its mere presence was an affront to their reality, a perversion of natural order. Jack Holliday stood amidst the chaos, his resolve tested like never before. His gaze fell on the pulsating entity, a beast from beyond their realm. Emma stood next to him, her eyes reflecting the alien horror. They had known something was coming, but the magnitude of their plight was beyond comprehension. The military was powerless. Bullets and grenades passed through the entity, their energy abs vesseled, their matter disintegrated. The entity moved unhindered, its dark form gliding over the buildings, swallowing them into its mass. Panic was rampant, the screams of the townsfolk echoing through the night. Jack mobilized his officers, directing the evacuation. 
His voice was the anchor in the storm. His only hope was to get as many people to safety as possible. Meanwhile, Emma was locked in her cabin, her hands shaking as she tried to decipher the alien signal. She felt a connection, an understanding with the entity. The patterns, the pulses, the signals, they were all pieces of a grand cosmic puzzle. She was their translator, their only hope of communicating with the entity. The evacuation was chaotic. Families were separated, homes abandoned, their lives reduced to frightened whispers and desperate prayers. In the town center, Captain Anderson faced the entity, his men falling back, their weapons useless. He could only watch as the entity continued its destructive march, a tide of darkness swallowing their world. As the night wore on, the entity moved closer to the town center, drawn to the alien vessel. Emma, watching from her cabin, realized the horrifying truth. The vessel was not just a beacon, but a portal, a gateway to their world. The entity was not the only one coming. It was the Harbinger, the first of many. She relayed her discovery to Jack, her voice a mix of fear and urgency. The implications were damning. The entity was just the beginning. More would come, each one potentially more devastating than the last. With this knowledge, Jack made a desperate decision. They had to destroy the vessel. It was their only chance to close the portal, to halt the incoming tide of alien horrors. Emma argued against it, fearful of the potential repercussions. The vessel was their only source of understanding the alien entity. Destroying it could anger the entity further or even accelerate the arrivals. But Jack was adamant. They had no other option. In the face of impending annihilation, Jack and Captain Anderson mobilized a desperate plan. A cache of explosives was collected, their intent to shatter the alien vessel and stop the signals coming from it. The mission was suicidal but it was their only chance. As the dawn approached, the town of Pasadena was unrecognizable, its peace replaced by terror, its tranquility by chaos. The entity had woven a tapestry of horror, and they were mere threads in its cosmic design. The day of reckoning was upon them. Their plan was set into motion, the town holding its breath. Jack and Captain Anderson made their way to the town center, the vessel pulsating ominously, the entity looming over it. Their hearts pounded in their chests, the fate of their town in their hands. The first light of dawn found Pasadena in ruins, a grim reflection of the horror that had unfolded. The entity had spread, its dark form looming ominously over the town center. The countdown to their annihilation was ticking away with relentless certainty. Emma watched the sunrise from her cabin, the orange hue painting the sky with an eerie calmness. The dread she felt was immeasurable, her nerves frayed at the edges. She knew what was at stake. Her hands shook as she reached for the transmitter. She had to try one last time to communicate with the entity. In the town center, Jack and Captain Anderson stood before the alien vessel, the pulsating energy filling the air with static. Jack felt the weight of their decision. They were on a precipice, their next steps defining their fate. They began their operation. Carefully, the explosives were placed around the vessel. The vessel seemed to sense the impending threat, its pulsations intensifying. The energy it emitted grew stronger, a sign that their time was running out. The entity watched, its form flickering as if responding to the vessel. From her cabin, Emma tapped into the frequency of the entity, her voice trembling as she sent her message. She tried to explain, to plead, to reason. Her words echoed into the void her plea falling into the cosmic silence. Back in the town center, the explosives were set. The finality of their actions hung heavy in the air. Jack took one last look at the vessel, a symbol of their impending doom. With a nod to Captain Anderson, he gave the order. The countdown had begun. As the seconds ticked away, the vessel pulsed wildly, the energy waves almost tangible. The entity stirred, its form swirling, reacting to the impending destruction. The tension was unbearable, the air charged with anticipation. Then the explosion erupted, a bright flash that lit up the town. The ground shook as the shockwave rippled through. The vessel shattered, fragments raining down. The silence that followed was deafening. In the aftermath, Jack and Captain Anderson stood amidst the wreckage the alien vessel destroyed. But their moment of triumph was short-lived. The entity roared, its form fluctuating violently the shock of the vessel's destruction echoing through its being. 
From her cabin, Emma heard the explosion. She watched as the entity writhed, its form expanding. A sinking feeling of dread washed over her. The entity was not deterred. It was enraged. As the entity grew, it consumed more, its energy hungering for life. Houses, trees, cars. They were all swallowed, their existence erased. The townsfolk watched in horror as their world was consumed by the alien entity. Jack and Captain Anderson realized their mistake. The destruction of the vessel had not halted the entity. Instead, it had provoked it, accelerating its destruction. The realization was a punch to the gut, their hope turned into despair. As the entity spread, Jack made a desperate call to Emma. Their plan had failed. They needed another way to stop the entity. Emma, in her despair, knew of none. The entity was beyond their understanding, a cosmic horror that defied their logic. Their desperation was palpable. The town was being consumed, the entity unstoppable. The dawn of their annihilation was upon them, the nightmare a reality. The once peaceful town of Pasadena was on the brink, their fight for survival seemingly futile. Pasadena was a town on the edge of oblivion, the once vibrant community now a playground for an otherworldly entity. The monster loomed ominously over the ruins, its darkness consuming everything it touched. Emma sat alone in her cabin, surrounded by screens filled with incomprehensible alien patterns. Her brain was fried from relentless efforts to comprehend the alien signals, but she had nothing to show for it, no revelations, no solutions. All she had was an escalating sense of dread. Meanwhile, Jack and Captain Anderson were at the center of the town, staring at the remnants of the vessel. Their attempt to halt the entity's destructive march had failed spectacularly. Instead, their actions had expedited the alien nightmare. Emma was on the brink of giving up when an idea struck her. A pattern she had overlooked, a signal embedded within the alien communication. She realized they had been trying to communicate, not with them, but with the entity. The vessel was a containment device, not a portal. Its destruction had freed the entity, allowed it to grow uncontrolled. With newfound determination, Emma worked tirelessly to decipher the signal. It was their last hope, a slim chance to communicate with the entity and hopefully stop its rampage. Simultaneously, Jack, Captain Anderson, and the townsfolk prepared for their last stand. They had no weapons that could harm the entity but they were determined to defend their town to the very end. As the night crept in, the entity grew restless. It started to move towards the remaining populated area, its hunger for life energy unabated. The townsfolk watched in horror as the living nightmare drew nearer. Emma was running out of time. Her brain was working overtime, her fingers flying over the keys as she struggled to decipher the alien signal. Finally, she broke through. The signal was a control sequence a command designed to rein the entity. Without wasting a second, she transmitted the decoded signal towards the entity. She watched with bated breath as the entity reacted, its form fluctuating violently. At the town center, Jack and the rest of the townsfolk braced themselves as the entity roared. It was a sound that reverberated through their bodies. The entity convulsed, its form growing erratic. Emma watched as the entity recoiled, its rampage momentarily halted. She continued to transmit the signal, her determination unwavering. Suddenly, the entity shrieked, a sound that ripped through the silence of the night. Its form began to shrink, the shadows it had consumed being expelled. Slowly, the entity was being contained, forced back into a smaller form. The townsfolk watched in disbelief as the entity shrank, their world slowly being returned to them. The sense of relief was overwhelming, their impending doom averted but the celebration was cut short by the entity's final roar. In its death throes, it lashed out one last time, a wave of dark energy heading straight for the town center. In the heart-stopping moment, Jack shielded Captain Anderson, their fate seemingly sealed. But before the wave could hit, it dispersed, the entity finally succumbing to the alien command. Silence descended upon Pasadena. The horror of the night replaced with stunned relief, they had survived, their town spared from total annihilation. As the first rays of dawn painted the sky, they took a moment to appreciate their victory. It was a hard-fought battle, one that had pushed them to their limits. But they had emerged victorious, their spirit unbroken. The nightmare was over, the alien horror vanquished.
but their town bore the scars of the night, a grim reminder of the alien horror they had faced. As they stood amidst the ruins, they knew that their lives would never be the same. The dawn of a new day brought with it a sense of surreal calm. The once throbbing heart of Pasadena was now a ghost town, the silence only punctuated by the occasional distant rumble of debris settling. The entity was gone, and in its wake it left a battered town and its traumatized inhabitants. Emma sat exhausted in her cabin, her fingers still resting on the keys of the transmitter. The screens around her flickered aimlessly, the alien signals replaced with static. She had done it. She had saved her town. A sense of relief washed over her, coupled with an overwhelming exhaustion. Her eyes felt heavy, and as the adrenaline of the night ebbed away, she found herself drifting into sleep. At the town center, Jack and Captain Anderson emerged from the dust and debris. They looked at each other, their faces lined with fatigue and relief. Around them, the townsfolk started to gather, their faces a mirror of the disbelief and relief that Jack and Captain Anderson felt. In the days that followed, Pasadena slowly began to rebuild. The streets once filled with terror and destruction started to show signs of life. The townsfolk worked together, their shared experience of the nightmare fostering a sense of unity that was stronger than ever. Emma was hailed as the hero of Pasadena, her efforts to decode the alien signal celebrated. But she bore the title with a heavy heart. She had saved her town, but at what cost? The memories of the entity and the horror it wrought haunted her. She found solace in her work, her focus shifting to understanding the alien signal and the civilization that sent it. Hey sci-fi horror fans, thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Thank you to all our official supporters of the channel. Craving another scary story? Click on that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone. And remember, stay cosmic.